Hi, and welcome to Thor's Day Comics. I'm Tom Scholey, author of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. And today we're talking about Journey into Mystery number 89, starring the mighty Thor. The Thunder God and the Thug. What happens when, aided by guns and goons, a mortal gangster dares to defy a Thunder God? Our story opens with the mighty god of thunder streaking through the sky after the completion of his most recent adventure. In the credits, it says, Plot, Stan Lee. Script, L.D. Lieber. Art, Jack Kirby. Inking, Dick Ayers. Lettering, Ray Holloway. Don't know that I've ever read this comic before reading it in preparation for this episode. Uh, It's an early Thor, and uh, we've talked about like the similarities to... Superman comics, and this is a very Superman comic. It's it, and you kind of see it right off the bat. Now, in the previous issue, they established that that Don Blake used dummies of Thor to kind of get him out of uh, different situations. He goes to this uh, warehouse, uh, this office full of mannequins, and in order to distract attention from himself, he makes a uh, Thor dummy very quick and throws him out the window. I I kind of think the way. Um, Thor has these like amazing sewing skills. You see the the ream of of fabric to uh, quickly whip up a a uh, Thor costume for this mannequin. Makes me think of uh, you know Jack's father working at the uh, sweatshop uh, in the garment uh, industry. You know the idea of sewing and and whipping something up uh, quickly would have been familiar to him. So uh, Thor takes this dummy, throws him out the window, and everybody's like, hey, there goes Thor. And then he slips in the back, changes back into Donald Blake, and and nobody noticed the difference. No, nobody would suspect for a second that he was Don Blake. So that in itself seems a little Superman-y, you know, something you wouldn't associate with Marvel or, or Kirby or this like sort of, you know, 60s Marvel. You know, a lot of this... Uh, sleight of hand and distraction to, uh, you know, keep people off the trail of his secret identity. Um, Still fun, though. And so now we get the recap, you know, always helpful uh, in this era of comics where where kids are just sort of finding these randomly uh, on the shelf. And from what I understand, the distribution of, um, like, the early Marvel comics wasn't great. I mean, of course, you know, there's the famous stories of how they're still, you know, at this point being distributed by DC Comics, uh, a distributor owned by DC Comics. So, you know, that that in itself sounds like it would present some problems. And Jane is sort of, uh, you know, pining away for Dr. Blake, but she, uh, and Dr. Blake looking, uh, you know, every bit like Steve Rogers, um, she's pining away for Dr. Blake, but she knows that he's just not interested. That's that's not, you know, he's, he's so busy with his, his career and he's so introverted, uh, he could never have any interest in her. And so she's forced to fantasize about Thor. That's kind of established here that, that um, you know, she, she would rather be with Don Blake, but he's just not an option. So she has to retreat into fantasy, much like the, the readers of this comic, uh, you know, escapism. And so we have, uh, again, like sort of like a, a Lois Lane kind of thing uh, you'd see in like the 50s or 60s where she's having a fantasy about their domestic life. And very uh, like sort of sitcom uh, tropes, uh, you know, chauvinist ideas about uh, you know what women are are looking for in a relationship. So uh, you know, and so sort of immediately domesticating this warrior god, um, and so there she is polishing his hammer. Maybe the most overtly sexual uh, thing we've seen in in a Thor comic so far. Um, so there she is polishing his hammer, which is. Uh, is is a you know it's a euphemism it's not a stretch and then here she is ironing his cape and this kind of reminds me there was like a um there was like an ad that would run in comics in the uh in like the early 2000s where Thor is like ironing his cape and this kind of uh you know reminds me of that and then you, you think of um Delilah in Kirby's comics, the way he'd reference the story of Samson and Delilah you know famously in the Boys Ranch story Mother Delilah but uh, here she is, a uh, sort of the ultimate act of uh, domestication, and uh, her polishing his hammer, taking his hammer away from him, and 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 polishing it seems like a uh, a uh, symbolic uh, castration. I, I don't think castration is the right word. I think castration is just when you lose your balls, but uh, 
you know, she takes his hammer, starts polishing it, takes his cape and starts ironing it. And now, uh, you know, uh, the story of Samson and Delilah, she cuts off his hair. But it, this is her fantasy, so uh, Thor is very excited about his new, uh, his new haircut, more conformist. And, and, and so, uh, um, you know, Jane wanting to, to live a, a conventional conformist life with, with uh, Thor, um, you know, f fits right into her fantasy. Now we have this sort of, um, you know, steps outside the courthouse. Uh, looks kind of like the, the steps where... Uh, uh, at the end of The Godfather, where uh, you know they're, they're, they they shoot the one mafia leader as he's as he's you know coming down the steps, and um, the the plot in here is kind of interesting. It's um, you know Thor versus a gangster, which is kind of like that that would, later on in the Thor run that becomes like a filler plot almost, like when when um, th they want to break from Thor's ongoing cosmic narrative, or or maybe when they're just kind of out of ideas or, or you know, what, whatever, uh, and, and need something quick. Um, Thor versus Gangster seems to be a stock one. And, and uh, you know, as a reader, as a fan, uh, I'd always be disappointed when that would be the plot in an issue. Not what I'm looking for from a Thor comic, but still, I mean, this is a superhero comic, and I, I guess you got to do this every now and then. The crimes of this guy, he's not, it's not like Murder Incorporated or something. He his crimes are selling substandard steel and, and uh, I guess also some like sort of racketeering, like sort of forcing companies to take his substandard steel. But it made me think like, wow, that's, that's a really interesting, very specific crime to come up with. And uh, I feel like today, um, you know, somebody caught selling substandard steel wouldn't even be a scandal. That, that wouldn't even register today. So uh, it gives you an insight into, into the times then and the times now. I'm kind of picturing like what the, you know, what the, what the reality of that is, like, um, especially to like a kid reading this comic back in the 60s, you know, is that, or maybe it's, it's a result of, of the comics code where it's like, we, can, we can't have him accused of a crime that's too scary or something. Uh, so I'm just wondering what the logistics are of it. I guess like, you know, I could see maybe if if he sold substandard steel and then, you know, a building collapsed and people were, were hurt or killed, I could see that having criminal ramifications. But I could also see, you know, somebody nowadays just sort of, uh, you know, getting out of that one. But yeah, they're, they're on the lookout for this guy who sells substandard steel. I guess also like they don't say it early in the story, but later in the story they say that he kind of like he forced companies and, and people to buy his substandard steel. So that would imply some like threats of violence. But anyway, so we have some gangsters, uh, you know, and Kirby talked about how, you know, he grew in the neighborhood he grew up in, uh, you know, a lot of the guys he grew up with grew up to be a gangster. You know, something he has some firsthand understanding of. Look at how these guys tower over Don Blake and and uh, Jane Foster and, and they intimidate. Uh, their Their boss is hurt. You know, he got shot. Where are you taking me? To Sunday school. Ha, ha, ha. Take him to the hideout of their boss who's, who's been injured, been shot or, or whatever. And Don Blake, you know, has to, has to work on him. He's, he's uh, they're trying to get him to become one of those like organized crime affiliated doctors. You know, the doctor you call when you can't go to the hospital because you got some bullet wounds and you might get into trouble if you show up there like that. We're getting another element I, I feel we haven't seen yet in, in this series. You know, we've seen Odin help and intervene, but never so directly as this, where, you know, before it was like, oh, Thor asked him to give him some power and bring on the storm. But in this, it's like Don Blake is powerless, separated from his his uh, hammer or, or walking stick. And so he prays to the sky god Odin to, to get him out of this one. And so Odin, you know, sends down some lightning bolts. So sort of this like, divine intervention, deus ex machina, you know, becomes part of the later stories and sort of reinforces this like larger, you know, the larger mythology. Uh, count on Kirby for some of these cool little uh, action adventure solutions. He hits a floorboard, the guy goes flying, lots of fun. This is kind of Superman-y, but he blows the tablecloth onto the guys and then ties them up, throws them up into a tree. One of the guys is making a getaway. He throws a hammer, which knocks down uh, one after the other, a series of trees, very, very fun, also beautif beautifully drawn. And so now we're seeing what happens to uh, the boss and his his gun maul, you know, his girlfriend. And, and again, this is a stock plot. It is a plot that I associate with Superman, but I mean, obviously Superman didn't invent this. It's just something that, that you know, recurs often in Superman stories. 
uh, especially you know in the early days of Superman, where you have the the gangster, but then he's got like a girlfriend. Uh, we'd also see this in the '60s Batman uh, TV show again and again. Um, they have a, a girlfriend, and and she's almost like his conscience, uh, you know, this this soft spot, and and. Um, you know, sort of humanizes the villain, makes you more interested in the vi- villain's story, and, and and of course makes the hero uh, more sympathetic to to what's going on with the villain. Uh, the thug has um, is holding Jane ransom, and and he's deduced that Thor is very dependent on his hammer for his power. So he's like, drop the hammer, drop the mallet. And uh, I was thinking how interesting it would be if this were a silent panel. I mean, obviously, I don't think anybody intended it to be a silent panel. I don't think Kirby intended it, or 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 Lee or Lieber, but just how nice that would be, just sort of, you know, Thor given this uh, intense stare. And now something distracts them, and it's uh, Thor using his super ventriloquism. Again, another, like, you know, holy shit, this is a, this is a Superman comic with, uh, you know, with long, with, uh, long blonde hair and, and, and a, a winged helmet, you know, that's using his super ventriloquism. He says he's got super muscular, developed vocal cords, so it, it makes it easy for him to throw his voice. And so everybody gets distracted, turns around, and then he, uh, he kicks the hammer, and once it's airborne, it comes flying back to his hand. He creates a vortex that, that uh, gets Jane out of there real quick. He follows. Uh, his girlfriend says she just doesn't want to be with him anymore. She doesn't want to be part of his crime. You know, the, the, the sort of a turning point that often happens in these stories. And she's his conscience, but, uh, you know, he doesn't want to listen to his conscience. He's, he's now, you know, 100% fully committed to this path that he's on into a um, construction site. Some classic Kirby stuff. Kirby's been doing this his whole career. Uh, the earliest one I can think of off the top of my head is... Uh, Captain Marvel Adventures number one, uh, where he, the uh, Shazam comic that Jack Kirby and Joe Simon did, and, and uh, um, Shazam fights a guy named Z up at a um, construction site. Awesome stuff. He has so abandoned, you know, reason. It, it looks like he's, he's going to kill her for not, not going along with him. And so, uh, you know, Thor blocks the bullet, saves her life, does, does some... Uh, you know, some real hero stuff. Now he's ready for action. Taps his hammer four times, as the editor reminds you, and uh, to create a lightning bolt that, that hits the, the, um, the girders and starts to melt them. He comes out and, and sees a bunch of hot rivets, and he threatens the crowd. He threatens to dump these hot rivets on the crowd. The steel beam that he's on, uh, having been weakened by the lightning bolt, breaks. Thor gets up, rescues him, and people speculate that, hey, maybe that um, that steel girder that, that fell apart, maybe that stuff melted so easily because that might be the steel that he himself sold. So that's a nice, nice sort of poetic justice, a nice way for the story to come full circle, that he very possibly was, was um, almost killed by, by the, the substandard steel that he's, he's been putting out into the world. Thor does one, one last prayer to Odin, asks for one last boon, as it says in the text, to have um, the memory of Thug Thatcher removed from her, a, a sort of, uh, you know, mind erasure, another Superman thing, a, as seen at the end of Superman 2, that let's erase this whole, this, this guy right out of your mind, uh, you know, live life without all that heartache. It's a plot element that, that you know, uh, appears in later issues and, and very, uh, very importantly in, in an issue where, in a similar way, Odin removes Jane Foster's memory of Thor so she doesn't have to deal with the heartache of, of not being married to Thor, not ending up with Thor. And so Thor goes off, you know, into the air, into further adventures, and we get a tease for the next one, the Carbon Copy Man, which I'll be talking about next week in Journey into Mystery number 90 starring the mighty Thor battling the super creature from space, the Carbon Copy Man. Great name, great look. We'll talk about that one next week, and I'll see you next Thursday.